Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, the morning edition. And one of the things that I see in American car culture is the differentiation between a full-size car and a compact or subcompact car. Now, when did these classifications come out? Who started the compact cars? Well, a lot of people think it was the big three starting in 1959-60 with the Plymouth Dahlia, the Dodge Lancer prior to the Dart, the Corvair, the Chevy 2, and later the Dart when it became a small car. But it goes back further than that. You've got to go back to the 1920s, 1930s. American Austin, a company formed in the United States in 1929, produced the first I guess you could call it a subcompact car because it only sat two people. It was a little closed sedan, and they had the Bantam Roadster, which has really found favor in drag racing on alters. But they were the first ones to bring in a true, or not bring in, but produce a true compact or subcompact car. It wasn't the big three. GM, Ford, Chrysler, they didn't have compact cars in the United States. Now, when you go to Europe, Japan, China, Australia, those countries already had compact cars. The American cars, by their standards, were huge. Uh, Pete Muriello, uh, the 6 o'clock show was not on Facebook yesterday. It was on Zoom. But I'll get to that. I'll repost that show for you a little bit later today or tomorrow. But the compact car, as we know it here in the United States, well, we were different. We had huge, big cars. Uh, Randy Cardoon and I spoke with Steph in I Drive Classic Cars, a show in the United Kingdom. And she was amazed how Americans could have such huge cars. Well, it's just the way it became. Now, in the early days of car production, the Model T, by today's standards, would be a compact car, but it was a full-size car for the time. There are cars larger than that. They didn't have a classification of compact and full-size. Packard, Cadillac, Lincoln, they were huge cars. Rolls-Royce continues to make big cars, and it's one of the few in Europe to do so. Most cars, by physical size, are considered I guess you could say a compact car in the U.S., but that's the normal size outside the United States. Roads are narrow, based on uh, the configuration of the roads and where ho housing was made back when the days of the wagons and buggies. So those roads really didn't get widened. Now, we have an extensive highway system here in the United States, thanks to President Eisenhower, who, after World War II, said we need some way to get military from one end of the country to the other end of the country. And the federal highway system was developed. Route 66 was one of the first. They widened the roads. They made them big enough that military transports could go down the road. And American cars stayed large. They got large. But the compact craze started coming in, and it wasn't, like I said, the big three. They're best known for the cars in the 50s. That's when the compacts, or late 40s, 49, the compact cars started to appear. They weren't real popular, though, because most people, having families, saw these as confined cars. Now, if you watch the original Superman TV show, you saw the Nash Rambler or Aeroflight little rollback convertible. By today's standards, that's a compact car, and it was a small car for the time. Now, the full-size Nash looked just like the small one, but it was a whole lot bigger. General Motors didn't have anything in this frame of, of car sizes in the United States. They did have them in Europe. They had them in Britain, called the Vauxhall, and in Germany, or the rest of Europe, called the Opel. Those cars started coming into the States in the late 1950s as imports, Ford even brought in their Cortina and Anglia for a while, but really didn't support them wholeheartedly, and very few came into, into the United States. But those were 
full-size cars in Europe. Now, Henry J. in 1951, a compact car by today's standards and even the standards of then, but they were wide. You could get six people in that car, but it was a small car in overall size. That came out by Willys, not by the big three. Willys also had the Willys Arrow and the Hudson Jet, another compact car. And if I remember correctly, one of the first uses of unibody construction, other than the Chrysler Airflows that came out early on. Now, in 1954, there were 64,000 compact or small American cars made or imports. you got to remember the import market started to begin with sports cars when returning servicemen from Europe started bringing them over. And they were small cars at the time, especially compared to an American full-size car. And I know I ran into a situation once when driving an Austin Healy. I owned a Bug Eye Sprite, and a guy with a full-size Ford was looking out the passenger window to see the car. And, oh, it just drove me off the road because he, he was infatuated with this little thing that the roof wasn't any higher than his window frame. But small cars started coming in to fashion about 1958, 59, 60 in that era. And the Studebaker, Lark, their whole line became a compact line. Studebakers downsized their, their whole line of cars. And that may have been part of what hurt them because many people still wanted full-size cars. Compact cars were something, well, they bought them for a certain purpose. Now, even the trucks started going into compact size beginning in 1961 with the Corvair Green Briar. Ford introduced the Econoline vans, which were compact vans compared to the other types of vans that were out at the time. Ford Econoline Dodge A100. Studebaker had what they called a zip van. Now, you may not remember them because they really didn't have much lettering on the side that said what they were. But the post office bought many of those as mail delivery trucks. So that came out. And uh, about 1959-60, the import car population grew to about 14% of what Americans were buying at the time. And one of the first major manufacturers to come into the U.S. was Volkswagen. Max Hoffman, an importer and entrepreneur, started bringing in many of the imported cars from Europe, and the Volkswagen was one of them. But the Volkswagen didn't see the success that he thought it should see, and he sold off that distribution system back to Volkswagen. Volkswagen just soared after that, but Max Hoffman had BMW, he had Porsche, he had the Brits, the British cars, and a lot of other manufacturers that he represented and imported based out of his offices in New York. He later moved to California and Southern California, and then New Jersey, where he set up BMW and Mercedes U.S. headquarters. But during the 1960s is when small American cars started to gain traction hmm. and popularity. The Volkswagen Beetle was part of that. The Americans continued on with compact cars, and their sales started to soar. People were starting to be concerned with fuel economy and, well, just the size of the cars. A lot of people were uncomfortable driving big cars because of limited sight and, and what have you. But the enthusiasts, they still gravitated towards the big cars, and then the domestic manufacturers said, well, you know, we can put these big V8 engines in these compact cars. A whole new market was born. The Dodge Dart, the Barracuda, the Camaro, the Mustang, even the Ford Falcon got performance. And now there was another market for these cars. But if you look closely at the auto industry, through the early 19, mid, and even the, the late 1950s, you had one body style, and then you had different variations of that. There were no separate body styles. An example, uh, my wife's 1946 Ford. You could get the Super Deluxe or the Special Deluxe 
and you could get the deluxe. The difference was some chrome trim pieces. And that's pretty much how it stayed through the 50s. A Ford Fairlane. It was a higher trim level. The Ford Crown Victoria. An even higher trim level. Same basic body. So what they did is they changed trim, and that changed the model. It wasn't until the compacts came out that you had model variation, where you had an actually different body style for a vehicle. Now, the Corvair was unique in its time, and we've talked about that because of its rear engine configuration, air-cooled, independent suspension, and it went over quite well at the start. The Plymouth Valiant did okay. The Dodge Lancer only lasted a couple of years. They changed the name to Dodge Dart. Dart was a full-size car before that, the stripped-down model in most cases, and now the compact car was a Dart, and Dodge compact sales started to climb. For some reason, the Lancer name just didn't hold on. Exeter, who was the main uh, design chief for Chrysler, had some pretty wild styling cues on both the Valiant and the Dodge Lancer, and they weren't really all that well, well accepted. Although, they're kind of neat cars. I mean, even the Valiant had an aluminum six-cylinder engine, 225 cubic inches and an aluminum block. Quite interesting. They also had a performance version called the Hyperpack that had a four-barrel cast iron headers, a little bit higher lift cam, mm -hmm. and a little bit more compression. They claimed 225 horsepower out of 225 cubic inches. Remember, that's the old brake horsepower levels. Now, Richard Candahead says, I've owned two V8 four-speed 64 Ford Falcons. Actually, one has a 302 and a five-speed. Good change. And the basic motor for the compact Fords came about with a 221 cubic inch V8 that was in the Ford Fairlane and the Mercury Meteor. Then they moved it up in size. They won Indianapolis 500 with that motor, with the Lotus. And they punched it up to 260 cubic inches beginning in 1964. In 1965, the 289 came out. And that seemed to be the better of the small block Ford motors. And it was used pretty much throughout the line. The 260 just didn't have the torque that 289 needed. Now, Chrysler had the 273. That was their small V8 engine. And it was okay. It wasn't putting out the horsepower, possibly because of engineering limitations that they had placed on the vehicle but 225 or 235 horsepower with a four barrel and solid lifter cam chevrolet they were behind the times they didn't put a v8 in the compact cars the chevy 2 until 1964 and that was the 283 then the 327 and man that was a rocket ship with the uh, l79 option Chris Costanza says 62 darts were ugly. No, 62 dart was a full-size car. Yes, they called them ugly, fugly. And I remember one uh, friend racing one, that in the Plymouth. That was the year that Chrysler thought everyone was going to compact cars and downsized their full lineup. The 413, though, made that thing run strong. Debbie Bradshaw, the Buick Cascadia, or Cascada, compact built in Germany. Uh, could have been, and it was if it was a Buick, it was based on the Opel. And a lot of Buick dealers sold Opels as well during the late 1950s, early 60s, into the 70s and 80s when the Opel became an Isuzu. And I was working for Isuzu. It was the Isuzu I-Mark that uh, replaced the Opel because of the monetary exchange situation. The cost of the Deutschmark versus the dollar had changed so much, it wasn't financially feasible to bring the Opals in any longer. So, the agreement with General Motors owning, controlling interest in Isuzu, they rebadged the Opal, or the uh, Isuzu, as an Opal. Yes, Chris, they definitely called them ugly at Lions. And there was a guy that raced in the nostalgia of the NDRA series with a... Uh, a, a Plymouth version, 1962, and he called it Fugly. And I think uh, Ravel Models even made a model of that car with the decals that said Fugly on it. Sam Fiorini, how you doing? Cascadia was made in Poland. All right, good. Until last year. Now, Sam, you're the automotive expert. Who was Cascadia a 
tie into any of the domestics or the U.S. market cars? Was it a GM vehicle or was it a uh, homegrown Polish vehicle based on another manufacturer? Let us know. I'll be watching for your answer. But uh, yeah, there were, uh, we got a lot of cars. How many of you remember the Yugo? Yeah, Yugo. Yugoslavia. It's basically a car built on license from Fiat, if I remember correctly. But they were able to make it not work quite as well as a Fiat. It was a very small car, inexpensive, throwaway car is what a lot of people called them here. Now, there's been a lot of cars like that that have come into the United States. And you can see them rebadged under a different name. Now, it's not just in the United States, though. An example, the Austin, which we call the American Austin here, was a licensed vehicle, to an extent, to British Austin. Their Austin line there was also licensed to Nissan, and it was one of the first Datsuns. It was also licensed to BMW, and BMW called it the Dixie. They made some mechanical and engineering changes to it, giving it an independent rear suspension, and it was still the basic Austin chassis and design. Sam says, Buick convertible, Opel Vauxhall was the Cascadia. Thank you very much. I thought there was a tie-in to, uh, to Opel on that one. I hadn't seen one of those, so I wasn't that familiar with them, but normally if it's one of those that was sold by a Buick dealer, it had to be something based on an Opel because that's what it was. Now, Opel's been sold off, and General Motors no longer has Opel nor Vauxhall, those companies which were the, ger the, ger uh, the GM holdings in Europe are gone. GM also has divested themselves of Holden in Australia, and Holden is gone as well. Renault Le Car, yes, the Renault 5 sold here through Chrysler dealers as the Le Car. They also had another uh, Renault model that they marketed as well. So this is something else because, again, compact cars coming into the United States from Europe were sold through U.S. distributors. If you think about it, Max Hoffman first started selling Mercedes-Benz through Studebaker dealers. Yep, and that's where some, I think Studebaker took some of the influence on their Lark, their grill sizes. Gino, how are you doing today? Thanks for watching this. Gino loves. I got to see the, the the translation of what you wrote, though, Gino. Galito, I mean. But compact cars, not generic necessarily to the U.S. Sam for what's your saying? Let's see. Sam says, Opel Vauxhall just closed Holden, sadly. Yes, you're right. Now, Holden... Uh, is gone completely. At one point in time, they were going to, and I don't know if it's gone completely, they were going to import cars and rebadge them. But their manufacturing in Australia, Ford closed down all their manufacturing, and GM closed down all their manufacturing. They're rebadging vehicles in Australia and closed down all manufacturing. It's it's just really sad down there. Pete Muriella had an Opel, Opel GT. <laughs> yeah, and it had a headlight lever to flip the headlights over and open them up. And a lot of people called those the uh, mini vets back in the time because they somewhat resembled the C3 Corvette body styles. So the Mako Shark was influenced or influenced Opel back in those times. I got to drive at an Opel GT one time, and it was very claustrophobic to me because the fuel tank and trunk, or fuel tank, it had no trunk, kind of filled into the back of the seats. Sam says, they did import Chevrolets and GMCs, but no more. Yeah, they did. Uh, the truck size. When I worked on the truck division of General Motors, we sold a lot of medium-duty trucks in South America and down in Australia as well. We had, one at one point in time, GM was even contemplating bringing in the Holden Ute. The problem was, and we couldn't explain this properly, and I, I was in a meeting on this, they wanted to sell it as a Pontiac. We tried to convince the people who were much younger than we were that Chevrolet was the one with the heritage of the El Camino. And it would be best distributed through Chevrolet dealers as an El Camino. Although GMC did have their version of the El Camino, and they called it the Sprint for a while. But it was never sold as a Pontiac, and Pontiac didn't have a truck. They did have a sedan delivery in the early 50s. 
and through uh, late 1950s. A uh, friend of mine has a 1957 Pontiac sedan delivery, but they were primarily sold in Canada, not in the U.S. Pete Miorio says uh, he's in port. It's in Portuguese. Okay, I'll check that out once I get on my regular computer. I'll be able to check out the definitions uh, or the translation for what he said. But compact cars. They weren't indigenous to the United States. They were tried a number of times and really didn't start to succeed until the 1960s when the big three got involved and people started gravitating them for fuel economy reasons, size reasons. A lot of people like smaller cars. Now, if you want to look at a car, now this isn't considered a compact car, but look at the 1953-54 Plymouths. They were not very large cars, nor were the Dodges as well. They, by today's measurements, would be considered a compact car. Think about it for a second. We've had compacts. We just didn't call them that. All right. Your gas has been compacted for today. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, the morning edition. Thanks for tuning in. Gas, the morning edition, brought to you by Service Tech Equipment. You got that garage you're trying to outfit with the proper equipment to work on your car? Contact Service Qu- Service Tech in Simi Valley, California. Check them out. They're on Facebook as well, Service Tech Equipment. They're there. Hi, Craig. How are you doing? I got that in just in, just at the right time, just as you logged on. Hi, Craig Heidenthal from Service Tech Equipment watches us every day, and he's the man to talk to. By the way... I've got something that works fantastic that I got from Craig and something you might want to look into as well. And this is a gratuitous plug for service tech. But, you know, you've got your car sitting. You don't drive it very much. And you keep it on one of those battery tenders. What's a battery tender do? It just sends out a constant trickle voltage. How do you maintain a battery and keep it from sulfating? This is how. Now, I know it's looking backwards to you. And you can easily go to Service Tech's website and check it out. But this is a battery pulsing system that keeps your battery alive and keeps it from failing. And it also tests the battery voltage. Check it out. Service Tech equipment. Starting at $50, a pulsation system that keeps your battery alive and healthy doesn't just send in a trickle charge into the battery. This is an amazing system. I've got it on my cars. You should get it on yours as well. Service Tech Equipment. You can find them on Facebook right here, right now. Talk to Craig and check it out. Mention gas. Get a discount. I'm Hot Rod Bobby. You've got gas. The morning edition. And we'll be posting last night's show that was on Zoom. We'll put us posting it as a YouTube video. And it will also be on Anchor FM, Apple iTunes, and many other sites. I'll post them for you a little bit later on today. Thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas, the morning edition. Thanks for being a gasaholic.